Hello and welcome. This is Corinne Modokaitis, and you're listening to How She Really Does It, the place where inspiration and possibility meet. I'm so excited to have you here with me on YouTube. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button and like this video. Make sure to also head down to the description box below and click the link to sign up for my newsletter to get podcast episodes and Sunday's letters filled with love delivered to your email inbox weekly. Now here's the show. Hello and welcome. This is Karen Modekaitis, and you're listening to How She Really Does It, where inspiration and possibility meet at KDRT 95.7 FM. I believe there are many ways to live life. I believe there are many journeys for us to take. We can learn from others to see what is possible for ourselves. There are possibilities for all of us, not just the ones who've acquired great success, but including those of us who have stumbled lost our way, or only saw closed doors. With this show, now maybe you can see a glimmer coming through the windows. I call that the windows of possibility. Each week, I bring a guest who represents these possibilities. They too have had their own struggles and uncertainty, yet somehow they have found their way. My, ex- my guests are an example of what is possible when you continue, when you learn, leap, fall down, and get back up. I invite you into the space so you can ask yourself, if that is possible for them, what is possible for me? Really, ask yourself that. Join me each week for inspiration, empowerment, and entertainment. You can connect with me at my website at www.howshereallydoesit.com and sign up for my weekly newsletter where you'll get each interview delivered directly into your inbox. Dr. Harriet Lerner is a practicing clinical psychologist and is best known for her work on the psychology of women, marriage, family, and family relationships. She is the author of 11 books, including the New York Times bestseller, The Dance of Anger. Her latest book is Marriage Rules, a manual for the married in the coupled up. And one of my guests favorite or one of my listeners favorites, Brene Brown wrote a testimonial for Dr. Leonard's book. And she said, this is the marriage book we've been waiting for. It's packed with clear headed counsel and small doable steps that can turn a relationship around. I saw myself on almost every page, which led to a lot of head nodding, laughing and wincing. It's one of those rare conversations starting books that you dog ear, highlight, and read aloud to your partner at night. And that was from um, one of our former guests, Brene Brown, who's the author of The Gifts of Imperfection. Dr. Harriet Lerner, Lerner, hello and welcome. I'm delighted to be here. Welcome. So your book is, my first question is, who is this book for? Just married couples or just straight couples? Um, It's for any couples, heterosexual couples, gay and lesbian couples, any couple that's in a committed relationship and that has made a promise to the other to want to continue forward into the future and and keep both feet in the relationship when things get rough, which they will. Um, and I also wrote Marriage Rules so that if there's one person who has their motor running for change, they can use the rules. Because it takes two people to couple up. It takes only one person to make things a whole lot better. Ooh, I like that. Um, Dr. Lerner, just so that I don't overpower you on the voice end, if you don't mind speaking up a bit, but um, can you say more about it can take one one person in the couple to make it a lot better? Often when couples come to see me in therapy, they're secretly hoping that I'll fix their partner. (laughs) And, I mean, they may not say that, but that's always our secret wish. And, in fact, no change will occur in marriage or in a couple relationship 
until at least one person gets self-focused. And by self-focused, I don't mean self-blaming. I mean that that person gets calm enough to think about their part in the relationship pattern, even if their part is only 2%, and how they can change that part. Because I say going back to the dance of anger, and it remains true, that we can only change our own steps in the dance. We can't change the other person. But the good news is that when you actually make a significant change, then the old pattern can continue as usual. You know, that's so, isn't that counterintuitive of how we think, though? Well, at some level, we know it. I mean, we we know that, um, well, you know, even rats in a tea maze will vary their behavior if they meet a dead end three times. So I think that people actually, when they're doing their best thinking, know that their efforts to shape up their partner, or their mother for that matter, haven't been successful. (laughs) So people know that um, real change requires that they do something different. It's just very hard to get the motivation because people often, especially in marriage, are very angry and have a long list of grievances that may be quite legitimate. So then when they read rules about, um, for example, warming things up or dialing down the criticism or you know, wh- whatever it is I'm suggesting, it's a very normal reaction to say, well, you know, I'm not going to do that until he does that, you know. And actually, as a colleague of mine puts it, it's when the other person is being the biggest jerk that you're called upon to be your best self. It's just hard to get started. Ooh, I like that. When the other person is being the biggest jerk is when we're called upon to become our best self? Exactly, exactly. Ooh. That is, if you, if you have a genuine wish for a better relationship. Wow, that is great. Um, <laughs> only I would get excited about something like that. But uh, so in relationships, in your book, Marriage Rules, there are you cover a lot of different, I guess, themes of what runs the discourse for a lot of marriages. And um, one of the areas that I wanted to focus on today was in the areas of sex and affairs, because you had some really interesting stuff that I hadn't um, read before or talked about on my show. And um, so one of the things that you said was, uh, let's see, well, well, let's first talk on sex. And you said, the truth is that our erotic life is as unique as our fingerprints. It is something that every individual has to keep figuring out for herself or himself as he or she moves along the life cycle. Can you say more about that? Well, first let me say that I've been interviewed a lot about marriage rules, and you are the very first person (laughs) who has asked me about the um, sex rules, which are under the chapter, Forget About Normal Sex. Mm -hmm. So um, this is a, a welcome conversation. And... Yes, our erotic life is as unique as our fingerprints. And the reason I put those rules under the heading of forget about normal sex is that we all have these sex cops that have set up precincts in our brain about, you know, what frequency is normal and how often we should do it and what doing it means, you know, what constitutes good sex or real sex. And people are very vulnerable about sex and suffer quite a bit um, because they think they're not living up to to someone's standards. And I, I have a cartoon that I like. It shows two birds perched on a branch in a tree. And one says to the other, to tell the truth, I don't think I fly enough. 
And, and I like that cartoon because I think that's how people are about sex. If they're not worried about the frequency factor, they're worried about their equipment, their <laughs> desirability or their level of desire. And it is important to understand that sexuality is as unique as our fingerprints. It's something couples are always struggling to figure out. And, um, you know, don't let anyone boss you around about it. Well, and I love that. And you talk about um, in your book about how you're going to figure it out. Like, don't have an expert come in and tell you, well, this is the what you're supposed to do. Right. You, it's almost kind of like uh, my words. This is my words is go out and test and see what you like and what you may not like and continue to test. Well, exactly. Um, you know, women in particular have always had too many experts telling us what to do. And although, you know, I'm doing the same, <laughs> I'm a little bit biting the hand that feeds me because I'm certainly giving a lot of advice in marriage rules and in the forget about normal sex chapter. But I also say in the introduction of that chapter that when it comes to rules about your own body and how you want to share it with your partner, you are the ultimate expert, that you're the best expert on your own self. And that if reading any of these rules or reading any expert about any you know, article that you read, say, about sex, if it leaves you with a down feeling, don't blame yourself, you know, blame mm -hmm. the article, blame the, blame the expert in this case. So, right, you know, be, beware of expert advice, although I, act, you know, I give some good advice in this chapter. You, you do give good advice, but I don't feel like it's something that it's not a 10 step process, right? Like follow these 10 steps for a happy sex life. <laughs> it's, it's, you give lots. I think I look at them as nuggets, right? Uh -huh. of, and, uh -huh. and so you can go, well, would that work in my life? Or, and you also give people freedom. I think too, it's to, to when, when you put that down of the erotic life is as unique as our fingerprints. It's like almost, ah, oh, there's relief. I don't have to be like somebody else. I don't have to be this perception that I'm out there thinking that I have to be. So I don't know if you're really telling people what to do. I think you're providing a lot of information for people to then make choices. I, I think that's true for the most part in this chapter. I do um, give some very direct advice, which is not easy to follow, about one of the most common sexual problems that happen between couples. In fact, it's so common I consider it a normal problem, but calling it normal doesn't mean it's not painful, because it is painful. And that very, very common problem is that there's one person in the couple who is jumping through hoops to get sex and want sex and feels rejected. And then there's the other partner who really doesn't want sex and who equally dreads getting into bed at night um, because they fear their partner is going to initiate sex or it's hanging over them like an issue. And the bed has just become a place of, of pain and, and conflict. And I do have um, a rule for the pursuer, and I, I do have a rule for the distancer. So, you know, there are places where I say, you know, try this. Mm -hmm. And that's one of them. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and I think, but again, it's try this, right? It's not you must do this to therefore have this. You go try this. Exactly. Although <laughs> if the readers don't follow every single rule in marriage rules, I'll come and get them. <laughs> 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 you know, actually, I, I think in marriage rules that if one followed three, you know, even three of the rules, but the ones that really spoke to you, that it, it would make a very big difference. And right, I mean, when you read any advice book or listen to any expert, the, the challenge is to take, take what makes 
sense with you, run with it, and ignore all the rest. Because mm-hmm. as I said earlier, um, women especially have suffered so much from experts telling them about their children or, you know, how to be a better mother or how to be better in bed or, you know, what's normal and, and what you should, you know, get very alarmed about. And, and really, uh, you know, we need to trust ourselves a lot more and just take what's really useful. I love that. We need to trust ourselves more. That is such great information for the listeners because I so agree with that. This is Karen Motokaitis, and you're listening to How She Really Does It. I am talking with Dr. Harriet Lerner. She's the author of 11 books, including New York Times bestseller, The Dance of Anger, and her latest book is Marriage Rules, a manual for the married and the coupled up. And so, Harriet, when it comes to sex, you, you talk about also um, our unconscious mind and sexual fantasies. And so can you say a bit more about the unconscious mind and the sexual fantasies that people may have? My, my rule about sexual fantasies is, quote, stamp your fantasy normal. Um, fantasies are just fantasies. And... I, that's hard for people to understand. They're, they're just fantasies, you know, in the unconscious. They, they come from some weird place in the unconscious. And fantasies don't even, sexual fantasies, they don't even necessarily reflect what you actually desire. You can have a sexual fantasy of your dentist tying you down and ravaging you in the chair, and you would be absolutely horrified if it really happened. I mean, fantasies are just fantasies, and they don't mean that um, you're, you don't love your partner. Your sexual fantasies are not an indication that you don't love your partner, and um, sexual fantasies can be very free-ranging and, you know, bizarre or whatever, and I say just stamp them normal because, you know, a fantasy is just a fantasy. Well, do you find with your clients that um, they have shame because they have sexual fantasies? Well, they have shame because they have, you know, some weird sexual fantasy. They have shame because it's not their partner that they're thinking about. They have shame, you know, I mean, people have shame about just about everything and you know shame is a real no good emotion that just makes us feel small and want to you know sort of fold up in a dark corner and of course people are very vulnerable about sex and people also um, you know although they may intellectually know better people want to own their partner's sexual fantasy and want to pretend that their partner isn't a sexual person who's going to have attraction to other people. And marriage, if you um, have a promise to be monogamous, which is my bias for sure, I know there are couples who have other contracts, um, that, that it doesn't help to pretend that, um, you know, your partner is, is a non-sexual creature. It only helps to be alert to, to real threats. And if you think that your partner has a relationship that, in fact, is at your expense. You know, I mean, let's say, for example, that um, you know, you have a partner who's working in very close connection with someone and, you know, wants to have dinner with that person and you experience it as a threat, you have every right to speak out and to ask for limits on that relationship. So you speak about this in your book, Marriage Rules, about when you were young in, you know, starting out in your marriage and you were in Berkeley with your husband and how the, um, the, I guess, boundaries 
sort of changed through your four decades of marriage. Can you speak to that time when you were young and in Berkeley and what those were then? Well, the, the point is really that, you know, we, we reevaluate um, sort of the rules around sexuality and what we expect from our partner as we get older and as we learn from experience and as we change. And when I was in my early 20s and living in Berkeley with Steve, and we were very married, even though we weren't legally married. And, you know, my philosophy back then, being a good Berkeley hippie, <laughs> although I originally uh, came from Brooklyn, so <laughs> really more Brooklyn, a Brooklyn girl. But my philosophy was, you know, if you love someone, you, you don't constrain their friendships, and if he wanted to, you know, go to the movies and go out with women or women who were my friends or his friends, that it was absolutely not my place to ever say, I don't want you to do that. I'm not comfortable with it. I want to come along. Um, I know you're saying that nothing is going on, but I sense something different. I thought, you know, well, this is a very high integrity guy and I don't want to constrain his freedom it's not my place and that uh, changed you know it actually changed for both of us when we um, were older mm -hmm. and you know where we would then you know not that we were paranoid maniacs you know in any sense of the word but where we would say to each other you know no I'm, I'm not comfortable with this and I don't want you going out and being alone with that person. And if it was going to bring the other person pain, you know, we just didn't, you know, we honored the other person saying, I can't manage this. I, I don't, you know, this does not feel right to me. And I think if I were a fly on the wall, you know, watching you with this person, that I would be upset and I don't want you to, you know, have lunch with her. I'll come along. Or, so it, it changed over time for us, and I think that would be true for any couple because if your relationship endures over time, as ours has, we've been married, Steve and I have been married for over 40 years, um, you're going to change and your thinking's going to change about everything. Mm-hmm. Well, and you had said in your book that um, we're actually not the most monogamous creatures on the planet. There are actually animals that are more monogamous than us. Absolutely. There are animals and birds that are more monogamous than us. Affairs happen in the best of marriages. They don't just happen um, in distant marriages. And I think it's not good to go to sleep about that. I mean, you know... I think that if your partner, you know, um, you know, says to you, he says, for example, you know, I love you. I've never been attracted to anyone else. I, I will never be attracted to anyone else. I can't imagine ever being attracted to anyone else. You know, I would say to him, you know, look, this is not reassuring to me <laughs> because it's not honest. I would rather know from you that when attractions arise, that you're going to sort of close this fence around yourself and you're going to move away from them and not cultivate them or even tell me about it if there's a real danger. But it is not reassuring when, when you say, you know, it's only you, baby. I would never want anyone else. Um, so I, I think it's good. Actually, affairs are more likely to occur if you put yourself to sleep and pretend that outside attractions don't exist. But Harriet, I think, isn't it every girl's dream to have the man say, you're the only one, I'm not attracted to anybody else? Or, you know, the, the Tom Cruise movie, I can't remember which, what it was, but it was like, you complete me, right? Like, don't women really just want that of, I don't want my husband or my partner to be attracted to anybody else. Yes, if we're talking about dreams and wishes. <laughs> <laughs> sure, and, and men too. I mean, men would wish that, um, you know, for a, a woman partner. 
And, yeah, I mean, one might wish that, but it, it has nothing to do with reality. And, of course, it, it's very true in the initial, um, the initial stages of relationship, in the courtship stage, to use an old-fashioned word, or the Velcro stage, as I call it. You know, it may be true, but if you're talking about a long, enduring relationship, and particularly if one or both people are in a high opportunity um, work context. You know, if you're married to a heterosexual male who is on an all male work crew, you know, and will never somehow <laughs> be in any kind of close connection to a woman he might be attracted to, you know, that's, that's different because opportunity is a big factor. But what the promise of marriage is about is it's a promise and the reason that people get up and make vows to forsake all others and they make these vows in front of God and community and their family and friends, they make the vow out loud because it's a difficult vow to maintain. And I think that what um, healthy couples do do is they will talk openly if they feel a threat. And they'll let their partner know that they know that attractions occur and they expect from the other person to, um, you know, not to cultivate it, to really move away from it before someone gets, you know, terribly under their skin. Well, in your book you mentioned that how... Um, a long-term relationship can never compete with that thrill of that initial attraction with somebody. And so that's, that's simply a biochemical, hormonal, uh, brain chemistry fact. You know, when people have outside attractions that have gotten out of hand or they're having an affair, um, you know, just the, they're awash in certain brain chemicals that you know, a, a marriage, and especially you add kids, of, with a lot of longevity, can comp it can compete in the sense of that particular, um, I don't know what to call, to call that feeling, which, you know, some people get so hooked into. Um, and and that's, just, that's just a fact. And, and, you know, and that gave me some great insight because sometimes when I think of some famous people recently, a, a very famous um, person, it's come out 50 years later that he was having an affair with this young woman on the news. And I just would have a hard time understanding it. But when you put it in the context of that, it made a little bit more sense to me. Not that I, you know, I believe in monogamy, but it, it made a little bit more sense to me about, okay, this is, this is maybe why somebody would choose to have an affair um, because there is that, you know, that initial thrill. There is that excitement. And, um, so right. And, you know, it's not, um, it's not an excuse. Mm -hmm. It's not an excuse to, to act on it. And in fact, I mean, I don't mean to sound like a big prude here, but in fact, if you understand that that kind of, um, chemical rush and what goes along with it is often this feeling of I found my soulmate you know I can't resist this thing no one else understands you know how this opportunity is you know it, it touches into my deepest self I mean if one understands that um, you know that, that that is if you value your marriage and you value the history that you've built together, it's something to to walk away from. It's not something to uh, say, oh, my God, you know, this feels so amazing. It must be the real thing mm -hmm. because that's not fair. And, you know, the, uh, the other thing is that what happens with an affair, since I think we've gotten on the topic <laughs> of affairs, <laughs> is that affairs are so devastating to marriage. Um, not only because of the sexual betrayal and the devastation for the harmed party. It's not just a sexual betrayal. 
Um, as one therapist put it, Frank Pittman, he said, it's not who you lie with, it's who you lie to. And what happens in affairs is that you're telling the truth to your affair partner. Your affair partner knows about the spouse, you know, knows mm -hmm. about your primary commitment. And you're lying to your spouse, whether in words or in silence. You're lying to your partner. And you, you um, can tell, you know, one lie, but it's impossible to tell only one. So you're engaged in a process of, um, throwing your partner off track, you're in a process where it's sort of like you don't have both feet in a relationship, you're taken out of your actual marriage by the affair. So there's, apart from the sexual issue, there's the matter of the dishonesty of gaslighting your partner, of throwing your partner off track. And that's also partly what's so devastating um, about an affair. Now, if you start lying, to, because you can't feel close to a person who you're lying to and setting off track. So the very fact of an affair, the fact you're tell, you know, that the affair partner knows the truth and your primary partner is being lied to, that in itself creates more and more distance in the marriage. So, you know, do the experiment of telling the truth to your partner and start lying to your affair partner, <laughs> you know, and you'll see what happens. This is Corinne Modokaitis, and you're listening to How She Really Does It. I'm talking with Dr. Harriet Lerner. She's the author of 11 books, including New York Times bestseller, The Dance of Anger. And her latest book that we're talking about today is Marriage Rules a manual for the married and the coupled up. So Harriet, as we talk about affairs, how, because you also bring this up in the book, how do couples overcome an affair? You mean once there's an affair and it's out in the open? Yes. I have a rule that says don't make your partner's affair a deal breaker. Because as I said earlier, affairs do happen in the, in the best, of marriages and if both people when when the information comes out in the open it is profoundly um, devastating and and shattering and all hell breaks loose um, but certainly as a therapist I have seen over and over that if after it comes out in the open each person is dedicated to each other and they're dedicated to truth-telling, and they're dedicated to the long process of healing, because it is a long process. It's not like, you know, he says, if he's the, the party who had the affair, it's not like he says, well, I'm, I'm sorry, you know, I'm, I'm so sorry, I'll never do it again, and then he expects that it's never going to come up again in conversation because he said, I'm sorry, and that's not enough. And it will come up again and again and again. And in fact, one uh, there's, there's a wonderful book that I recommend called After the Affair by Janet Abram Spring. And she has a very interesting concept that she calls the transfer of vigilance, meaning that what happens after an affair is the harmed party gets upset. You know, they get upset. And the person who had the affair doesn't want to hear about it anymore. It's like... Um, you know, I just can't stand hearing about it. It was like three years ago, and, and she's still bringing it up. And what Janice Abram Spring says to that person, let, let's say it's the man, if you don't want to hear about it, if you don't want your wife to be upset about the affair, you need to show her that you're thinking about it and that you're carrying the pain about it, so that you initiate a conversation 
about the affair and ask her how she's doing and let her know you're thinking about it rather than just waiting in silence, you know, thinking, oh, my God, when is she going to bring it up again? And Janet, um, I heard her talk at a conference, and she gave a very beautiful example of this where a couple had been through an affair many years back, and they had done a lot of work and a lot of healing, and they were out for an anniversary dinner. And what happened during the dinner is, you know, it was a very special evening, and they, you know, went to a special restaurant. And then the, uh, the waitress came over and said, Hello, uh, my name is Abby and I'll be your server today. Well, Abby was the name of the affair partner. (coughs) So (laughs) at that moment, um, the husband had a decision to make. He could just simply see if his wife said something or brought it up, or he could convince himself, well, maybe she didn't notice. (laughs) You know, like, right, you know, she's not going to notice the name. Um, And because he had been in therapy and understood this concept of the transfer of vigilance, he did something very important, which is without waiting for his wife to say anything, he took her hand and he said, I'm so sorry. You know, I wanted this evening to be so special for us, and I am so sorry for, for what I did, and is, is there any way tonight um, for this evening that I can make things better? And she said, you just did. Okay. And that is an example where... Um, so that if you're the person who's done the harm or had the affair, that part of the work, and I have this in one of the rules in marriage rules, is that you carry some of the pain and you bring it up. And, you know, it's, it's interesting, Corinne, because it's, it's not just affairs. It's any time someone has been harmed, whether... It's been a rape or sexual abuse or incest or something terrible in the family. We always wait for the harmed party to bring it up. It's if it's their job to always bring it up. Um, and what happens then is that the harm party just gets more and more obsessed with it. They get obsessed with it because they're the they're less to carry all the pain. No one is sharing it. No one else is is initiating the conversation. It's, is that, um, what I'm talking about is quite complex theoretically. I wonder if um, uh, oh, I, you understand I, what I'm saying. I get it. And what came up for me is when you think about the harmed party, it's like they're almost carrying this pain and not given the space for, is it to be vulnerable and then when the partner steps in and like, you know, the cliche saying spoke about the elephant that's in the middle of the room, right? Does that help allow more, more vulnerability? That's what I'm taking away. Tell me if I'm off track. Yes. And I'd add to that, you know, often when someone is harmed, again, whether you've been harmed by someone in your family in a very significant boundary violation or harmed by an affair, which is a very significant boundary violation, often other people will leave room for the vulnerability if you bring it up. Mm -hmm. And what I'm saying is that it shouldn't be the responsibility of the person who suffered the harm to, to always bring it up. I mean, an example is, I mean, here's a, another example, um, not about marriage, but it was a mother and daughter, and I wrote about this, I think, in The Dance of Connection, where the, um, the father, many decades back, had violated this girl sexually, 
and um, the family had been in therapy and had dealt with it as well as possible. And then, you know, let's fast forward 30 years later, and the father had died, and the mother and daughter went to a movie. And in the movie was a theme of incest. And they walk out of the movie theater, and the daughter doesn't say anything, and the mother doesn't say anything because she's thinking, well, maybe my daughter didn't notice, or, or maybe I shouldn't bring this up because it would just make her more upset, so I'll wait and see if she brings it up. And the daughter really felt totally abandoned by her mother because it's much better for the mother to say, um, you know, I, I don't want to bring up a conversation that you don't want to talk about, and, and just please tell me if you're not wanting to talk about this. But I couldn't sit through that movie without remembering the very, very painful thing that happened in our family with your dad, and I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry it happened in our family, and I wonder what it was like for you to, you know, even see that that movie, which must have brought it all up. So I, I think it's something to think about, to, you know, even if you witnessed, like this mother was not part, she was not to blame in any way for what her husband had done, um, but she said, I'm sorry simply for being part of this painful history, and, sh and she needed to bring it up. So that's what I mean by we, we might leave room for vulnerability, and yet we might fail to initiate the conversation, and it shouldn't be left to the harm party to always have to initiate a painful conversation. Well, I think of it as in a sense of, increasing vulnerability or an opportunity for vulnerability to be there because the whether it's the mother or the husband they're extending an olive branch they're recognizing the potential pain that this person is going through and they're sharing their vulnerability mm -hmm. that i mean that that's a very important piece of it that um they're sharing vulnerability they're saying i'm thinking about this I have not forgotten you and what has happened. I carry pain about this. You're not alone in carrying the pain. And I'm here to have the conversation, you know, when you're ready to have the conversation. You've lived through this. I want you to know I am always here, you know, to hear more details of what, what you want to tell me. So the vulnerability is not just the harm party, Mm -hmm. who's given the space to share the vulnerability, but that other people who love that person bring it up and say, how are you doing with this? I still think about this. I'm so sorry that this terrible thing happened in our family or in our marriage. So the vulnerability, in a way, is shared. Oh, I just love that. Um. So, Harriet, when a couple things that you brought up about affairs that really caught my attention and I was talking about it with friends as I was preparing for the interview with you this week. Um, one of the things, and you said this earlier in the show, and I really want to come back to it, is in your book, Marriage Rules, you say the paradox is that affairs are more likely to occur with couples that assume their marriage is affair proof. Why is that? There is no affair-proof marriage. Mm -hmm. there, there is no affair-proof marriage. And if you assume that, you can put yourself to sleep so that you're not alert to real threats. And, you know, again, I'm not um, encouraging people to become like paranoid maniacs, as I said earlier. Yet it's important to be aware of real threats so that you can say, you know, as we were talking about earlier, I am not comfortable with this. Well, it sounds like you're inviting people to be conscious in their marriage instead of just going along, taking things for granted, 
not paying attention because you know life is life can be really busy and at different points in our marriage there can be even busier as you talk about children but and it's easy to go on autopilot okay we're married we're committed here we go and be disconnected because you're not living this conscious like oh how do I want to connect with this person exactly and and this is a very complicated one that we're talking about because when we're anxious and I think everyone is anxious about sexuality. Everyone is vulnerable about sexuality with their partner. That when we're anxious, we tend to push the extreme. And one extreme that's very common is that we're overly jealous and overly vigilant. And you know we're watching our partner and we want to stamp out his sexual fantasies and we don't want him to have even the most flirtatious, innocent exchange with someone. And that's one extreme. And then the other extreme, you know, the one that you brought up is, you know, this marriage is affair proof and there is no way that my dear devoted husband would ever, you know, feel even a quiver for another woman. You know, that's the other extreme, and that's not useful either. And I think it's difficult for couples to find sort of their own middle ground in where they are with that. I mean, there, there are no rules. And like I said, in my marriage, it changed over, over time. And um, again, it's something people figure out for themselves. Well, and isn't, you know, one of the things you talked about was maybe discussing what your sexual fantasies are and not making it mean, I mean, I'm a woman, so making it mean that, oh, I'm lesser than because he's having these sexual fantasies, right? That's a very personal decision. There are couples who who share their, their sexual fantasies with each other, and um, that works very well for them. And there are people who... And probably, I would say, the majority, where it's, it's simply too vulnerable and not useful. And it's understood that sexual fantasies are private and you keep some to yourself. And again, the fantasies are, are just fantasies. So there's certainly no one size that fits all. Again, that's, that's something that people figure out. Interesting. And then one other thing, you talk about the myth and you say it's a myth that you can swear your partner to monogamy or keep him faithful by being the best lover and the most gorgeous person in the world. That's just back to the point that that we've been talking about, that humans are um, not very monogamous creatures in terms of fantasy life. And um, you know, and in terms of desiring other people and, you know, this notion that if you follow the advice in women's magazines, <laughs> you just, <laughs> I don't know, you're some very sexy person all the time, even when you're doing the laundry and you have kids pulling at you, that that's going to, I mean, w- what you really want to do, and this gets us back to the whole rest of the book, is that, is that you want to build a marriage that has a solid foundation of friendship and mutual respect. And that's really the best, you know, that you can, that you can do. And you always want to be working on yourself, your own life, your, your life goals. And so a lot of the rules, I mean, there's one chapter on sex, but the other rules are, you know, about how do you connect with a distant partner and how do you dial down the criticism and how do you warm things up and how do you survive kids and what are the challenges when there are stepkids at home. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, what's really important is that your, um, you know, as we talked about bringing, able to bring your best self into marriage because what happens you know, this is a very interesting thing about coupling up, is that when we initially couple up, we know how to make the other person feel loved and valued and chosen, and we automatically focus on the positive and speak to that. But the, mm-hmm. long, the, the longer couples are together, 
the more that automatic attention shifts and we automatically focus on the negative and what we're critical about. So we need to be intentional um, about focusing on the positive. And I mentioned John Gottman's mm -hmm. five-to-one ratio of positive to negative comments, which is his formula for divorce-busting, because obviously sexuality is just one part of marriage. There are happily, very happily married people where sex is not, you know, a big part or part of that. And, um, you know, there's, I think that in a way, one of the most important things that readers might take away from the book, from Marriage Rules, is that nobody can, um, can be happy in a relationship if they feel more judged and criticized then they feel valued and respected. And people forget that in long-term relationships. You know, they treat their dry cleaner a whole lot better than they treat their partner. So I have, I'm just thinking, you know, another chapter that I, I would say is probably the most important is the chapter, this is not a very sexy chapter, but it's a chapter on overcoming your listening deficit mm -hmm. disorder. Mm -hmm. my new diagnostic category is LDD, and really um, learning how to listen without defensiveness. And I actually think those rules, you know, it's hard to say what's most important, but people come into marriage with, we come into marriage with such a deep longing that our partner is really there for us and really gets us. And knowing how to listen when we don't want to is so central to that. So there's so many other other aspects. Oh, absolutely. And um, I thought the listening chapter was uh, really insightful and how you talk about the distancer and the pursuer. Right. And I know for a long time I'd be the pursuer because I'd want to talk with my husband because I had so many words to use in a day. And he mm -hmm. really didn't have as many words and how, you know, he would distance himself and how what I would make that mean. And and it's interesting because the less that I've pursued him, the more that he's shown up to want to have conversations in our marriage as we've gone through this next phase in our life. And um, so it, it was interesting to read the book and look at how my own marriage and, and our relationship over the last 18 years has gone through this, these changes. And you talk about how this is a process, which I just love, because I think in our culture, we expect things to, you know, it's like overnight, it's like a light switch, turning on a light switch and making these changes. And, and you talk about it's a process. I just Absolutely. love that. Absolutely. The change occurs slowly in marriage, and it's the direction, not the speed of travel that matters. And you know, it, it is true in terms of what you were saying about your marriage that if you pursue a distancer, he will distance more. You, you can take that mm -hmm. as a relationship rule of physics. And another rule, you know, related to pursuing, which I, this is actually the hardest for me in <laughs> marriage, is I have the rule of, you know, say it shorter. Um, men often tell me they don't want to talk, but actually... They feel afraid of getting trapped in a conversation that feels awful to them. And sometimes we don't realize it's the sheer number of sentences and the volume of sentences or the edge or intensity in our voice. And men, more than women, actually very quickly get flooded. And I have some rules that sound easy but are very difficult, like about making a criticism in three sentences or less or saying it shorter, um, but it can make a huge difference to practice those rules. Well, Harriet, I just so um, appreciate you being a guest today. It's been great talking with you, and I look forward to having you back on my show if that's possible. Well, same here. We have covered a lot of very <laughs> complex, difficult territory. We have, and you know, like I said, the next thing is not something that I talk about quite often in the show. And I thought you had some interesting insights. Oh, I'm in an affairs, you know, an affair proof, 
relationship. I've got this great marriage for people to realize you always are constantly, my word I always use is practice. You're thinking about, is this the life that I want to have? Is this the marriage? Am I treating this person the way I would want to be treated? And those are graders from your book. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, and I look forward to talking with you again. Thank you. This is Corinne Motokaitis, and you've been listening to How She Really Does It. My guest today was Dr. Harriet Lerner. She is the author of 11 books, including New York Times bestseller, The Dance of Anger. The book we are talking about today is Marriage Rules, a manual for the married and coupled up. Sign up for my newsletter at www.howshereallydoesit.com and have each interview delivered directly to your inbox. Early morning, fog is lifting. She's in a room.